So my name is Jakob Freiling. I'm a DevOps director at NetBank, and I'm super stoked to be here. It's my first time to India, first time speaking at the uh, Agile India conference. Um, I have spoken at various other conferences worldwide, including DevOps Days as well, um, but I'm really happy to be here with everyone. So a little bit about myself, just quickly. Um, I've got a little bit over 21 years experience in, in IT. Um, ten of those years I spent um, in Europe working for one of the largest investment banks. Um, and a little bit over a year ago, I joined NetBank in their, what we call the digital fast lane division. So it's a part of the bank that looks after uh, or looks at uh, disrupting the financial services industry. So we look at things like blockchain, IoT, uh, machine learning, and so on. So it's really an exciting space within the bank. Um, but the last year, I've been mostly uh, responsible for creating the DevOps practice within NetBank. And um, I'm going to talk about that with you all today. But just a little bit about NetBank, because I'm sure no one has ever heard of this bank called NetBank. It's a South African bank um, established in 1831. So it's a quite, quite an old bank. Uh, it used to be called Cape of Good Hope Bank, and then through a number of mergers and acquisition, later became known as um, NetBank Group in 2003. So it's got a little bit over 137 billion rand in market capital, trillion rand worth of assets, and we've got about 8 million customers. Um, so it's, a, it's a, probably the fourth largest uh, bank in, uh, in South Africa. Great. So today is all about DevOps. And um, when we started on this journey uh, a year ago, um, we really looked at three areas we want to tackle as part of our DevOps adoption, uh, being process, culture, and tools. Um, and the reason why I use this image of a bar stool is because if you think about it, if you cut off one of those legs, what's going to happen? You're going to fall over. The stool is going to fall over, right? You don't have stability. And that's exactly how uh, I think of DevOps as well. You know, you can't implement DevOps practices by just buying a tool and implementing a tool and think, great, now I'm uh, doing DevOps. You need to have all three of these um, capabilities in equal measures for, for you to really have uh, a sound uh, DevOps practice within your organization. And so really, what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at each one of these process, culture, and, and tools. Uh, one after the other, and sort of see how NetBank has adopted this in, in their journey over the last uh, year or so. So hopefully it will be exciting. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is culture. But um, I've decided to add some memes to, to my deck, so hopefully it's, it's funny to you. I know I had fun putting this together. Who can tell me uh, from which movie this is? Yeah, Lord of the Rings. Yes. <laughs> so that's Borimer saying, one does not simply do DevOps without culture change. And um, if, he's, if he tells me that, then I'll probably listen, because he's a one badass guy. So, um, so what did we do around the culture element of DevOps in, in our whole journey over the last year? So within the bank, and again, it's very important, and I think the theme has also come through quite a lot in the last couple of days, is you need to have um, buy-in from Exco level uh, within your organization for this to work. You know, you, you can try it out in pockets, but unless you have organizational buy-in, it's going to be very hard to drive this culture change throughout the rest of the organization. So we established or we embarked on this journey about two years ago, just before I joined, and we called it NWAR, which is New Ways of Working, basically. And it's all about being more customer focused. And again, that's also a theme that came through quite a lot in the last few days, be more customer centric, but also have a digital first um, strategy. So any new products we land, uh, we land on our digital channels first. And then obviously to be more agile in the process in, in, in adopting agile practices more rigorously um, throughout this journey and ultimately to become more competitive and not just to catch up with the competition, but to potentially leapfrog them as well in some of the products and services that um, we're taking to market. So we, we started to do this, and as, as part of this, we also had to restructure our teams to fit in with, with this model. Now, I think this concept is not new to anyone here, the idea of squads and tribes. I mean, it's been, it's been used elsewhere as well, but I think the, the important lesson to take away here is that you, 
you can't just take a model as is and apply it and think you're gonna get the economies of scale, right? So we had to change this to fit our needs. And I think that's an important thing. Within your own organizations, you need to understand what works and what doesn't work and to continuously change and improve on that. So for instance, the one thing that we have focused on is the squad level construct. So you have a team of multidisciplinary um, individuals, your developers, your testers, your design leads, your business analyst, your product owner, your scrum master, and your engineering leads, all forming a team and being product uh, focused. So each of these squads uh, look at a particular product that we were building as part of this NWOW initiative that we launched within the bank. And we started off with about uh, 12 squads trying this out and see how, how well it works for us. Um, and also, each of these squads would take a product from cradle to grave. So this team will build it and support it ultimately once in production. So there's no handoff to ops to say, okay, now it's your problem, you need to deal with it. Everything is dealt with by the team as well. So it's really, you know, complete autonomous team. While the team had um, options to choose some of the technologies they want, there was still an element of enterprise architecture that will guide them through that tool selection process and, and technology stack selection process, but ultimately they were responsible for, for the application stacks that they used to develop within. Now you will see that the picture of the little beehive and some bumblebees flying around. So we, we also came up with this idea of uh, uh, within the, 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 the DevOps team, which we call the best DevOps team, to create a hive. And the whole idea behind the hive is that you will have some of your DevOps engineers sitting in the hype looking at things like product selection, a rollout of new DevOps products, upkeep, maintenance, upgrades, and, and those kind of day-to-day uh, -day tasks that the, the engineers in the hive would typically take care of. But then you have the little uh, bees, which is our DevOps engineers, they will actually be in the field assigned to these squads. So they will actually be part of a squad and helping the squad to build out these pipelines that, um, that we are building for them effectively. And in that process, we are also cross-training the developers so that they can become self-sufficient in maintaining these pipelines and even build their own pipelines um, based on the, the, the skills transfer that happens between the DevOps engineers and the developers and the rest of the team. The idea is that the team should become self-sufficient and for those engineers to then go on to other projects and squads and help out on, on those as well. Um, another auxiliary function of this is that those engineers can bring back learnings back to the hive. So from that point of view, if, if from a DevOps point of view, they made a tool selection, but it doesn't work out in the field, the engineers can bring that learnings back and say, actually, this didn't work so well for us. We need to go and see if there's another tool that can solve this better. Or maybe we've tried something completely new, which we liked, and we can now adopt it across the rest of the enterprise. So that was also part of the role of the DevOps engineers um, sitting within these squads um, and, and giving this valuable feedback, continuous feedback all the time. So from the best DevOps uh, point of view, the approach was to redefine the software delivery process through, the colors might be a bit um, hard to see. Uh, the six areas that that best DevOps team would take care of, the planning and development, which is really, so we use uh, Atlassian tool stack for that, uh, Jira for uh, issue tracking and user story. Um, so the DevOps team would also create the workflows. As you go, if for you that know Jira, you have the concept of workflows. So we would define the workflows for the squads up front so they can just use it almost like a template uh, for how we create user stories and how we transition those stories through the different stages because our pipelines are fully automated and takes those um, into account as well when we build out um, um, the, the Jira workflow as well. And then they also work on the continuous integration, deployment, validation, and also optimization of um, the, the, the tooling that we support within, um, within the organization. One important thing to also remember or to, to know is that the best DevOps team are actually sitting within the change management organization. So why is that important? Because if you think about it, change management is gonna be one of your biggest inhibitors to adopting DevOps practices, because there's always gonna be a lot of governance checks and um, stages 
that will inhibit you from deploying as frequently as you like because you know you will have to go through things like change control management um, and open change requests and you can only deploy during certain change windows and those kind of stuff so by having the best DevOps team aligned with the change management team we were actually able to start breaking down those barriers because they are working very closely together and to, to try and, and remove those barriers and get to the point where we can continuously deploy all the time without having to manually raise change requests and get approvals and wait for change windows to open so that we can deploy. And working collaboratively with that team, we were progressively been able to, to knock down those barriers as well, which became a big part of the whole cultural aspect of it, if you, th if you think about it. You know, it's, it's, if, unless we get that buy-in, it's going to be very hard to adopt these kind of DevOps practices. Great. So that was more on the cultural side, things that we started to do in the last year or so. If we move to the processes, this is a good definition of, of debugging. A detect, uh, being a detective in a crime movie where you are also the murderer. And uh, as a developer, it, you know, it does happen a lot where you inadvertently introduce defects into your code, and then you have to debug your own code as well. So <laughs> I find, find this to be quite, quite, quite true, actually. Um, so what are some of the processes that we've introduced um, in our whole uh, journey? So the first one I want to talk about is the source code strategy. And it's all about you know, what kind of source code strategy you're going to use. You know, there's, um, again, this is also comes from the continuous delivery book, the trunk-based development. But there's also another one called Git Flow. And so we've actually taken a combination of both. Um, the idea is that we want to get to the point where we do trunk-based development, where every commit that the developer does happens onto the master uh, branch. But we also realize that that's not always feasible in, in, in our context. So what we've come up with is short-lived feature branches. So by using short-lived feature branches, and again, these feature branches shouldn't exist for more than two to three days. You know, we're not talking about weeks and months, we're talking about days at a time that, that we will skip on that. Because we know that the longer we wait to merge code from a branch backing, the more difficult it becomes. You get into merge conflicts and all sorts of nasty stuff that takes away a lot of time in debugging and trying to resolve those issues. So what we've said is, okay, we will use feature branches, but it must fit within a sprint, and especially within a couple of days, if, if we can do that. Um, and then also, really, to be able to um, augment that with uh, test-driven development, where when we do merge that code into the master branch, there's a certain number of checks that we're going to go through to make sure that the quality of the code you're committing is of a certain standard. So we won't just allow anyone to commit code onto the master branch, because that master branch is your path to production, if effectively. Any time, you should be able to take whatever's on your master branch and deploy it to production at the click of a button. You know? So you can't have broken code sit on your, your, your master branch. Um, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. We also do things like peer review. So any time you decide to commit code, you go through a pull request, and that gets reviewed by your peers. And that's also part of the, call it the quality gates that we have in place before, before we do that mergers. Then something we've started to play around with more recently is feature toggles. So feature toggles is really interesting because especially where you have code sitting on your master branch that's maybe in production, but you might work, in, work on new features that's not yet in production. Yet all your code ends up on this master branch every couple of days, how do we prevent th that unfinished code eff effectively from ending up in the hands of our customers? So we use feature toggles for that. So we can switch off those features while it's st still in development, and when we're ready, we just you know, flip a switch, and that feature is available in production. So we don't have to go and redeploy code or, or, or merge code back into the master branch and now go and deploy it um, into production. It's, it's all there. Test-driven development, Jess spoke about it this morning in his keynotes as well. That's actually something we do enforce uh, in the organization. Um, and, and it actually took a while for the developers to, to start doing this because, you know, as a developer myself, you know, nothing's more annoying when you just want to start coding and writing code, and now you can't because you need to write the test before you can start coding, and it's actually quite frustrating. 
but there is method to the madness in, in, in doing that. And um, by doing so, you actually make sure that the developer really understand what he or she is trying to build um, by thinking about it uh, before you actually start coding, which actually helps the thought process and the design process a lot. Um, like I alluded to on the previous slide, you know, we won't allow a developer to commit code unless they're at a certain level of code coverage. And uh, those kind of checks we run on every commit. So if you commit code without the necessary unit tests to support that, we will block that commit and throw it back to the developer. And by doing that, you start to enforce these kind of processes that the, you're trying to adopt. Cool, continuous integration. Another process that we decided to, to take quite seriously. Um, it's not just about compiling and shipping it, uh, although I wish it was like that sometimes. Um, again, you know, we have a lot of approval gates that we put in place from a continuous integration point of view to make sure that once the code lands on to our, what we call our continuous deployment pipelines, we know that it's reached a certain degree of, of um, quality before it goes onto the pipeline. Because remember that those pipelines that you create can run all the way through to production. So again, anything that lands on the pipeline, you need to make sure it's of the highest quality. Otherwise, you could introduce defects in production very quickly and bring down systems uh, very easily. So continuous integration does help with that. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later as well in, in, in more detail. Um, and really, you know, one of the key pillars to, to uh, building your DevOps practice is having a robust, sound CI uh, strategy in place. And then the deployment uh, part thereof, the pipeline or continuous delivery, whichever uh, uh, word you want to use for it, it then becomes your, your path to production, right? How you would jump through the different stages, uh, different organizations will have different stages that you need to jump through to get to production. Uh, we have a number of environments that we need to go through before we can deploy into production, and we need to prove that we've tested all our code in all of these environments before we can deploy. And again, the pipeline takes care of that for us, right? Through automated testing um, and other practices, this whole thing is fully automated, right? There's no manual intervention. You don't have to install code manually. You don't have to uh, kick off tests manually. Everything is uh, basically uh, zero touch, uh, effectively. And you need to have that kind of uh, process in place if you're going to make this uh, really work for you. Because again, there's no point in having agile development, but it still takes you three months to four months to get it into production because you have manual testing and you have servers that takes two weeks to stand up and you have approvals that needs to uh, get approved and firewall changes. It, you know, it just breaks down at that point. And, and again, this helps with that. Which sort of brings me to my next one, which is the continuous testing components as well. Um, so as part of these squads, like I said, we actually have the QA team sit within the squad. So they are part and parcel of the team. They sit with the developers, actually, literally, next to the developers. And as the developers start working on these user stories, the testers are starting to write the, the acceptance tests and regression tests alongside them already. Um, so, so we use you know, BDD development, so Serenity um, and Cucumber for instance, to do a lot of our automated testing in, and, and they will work very closely with the developers to make sure that they've got this. So that by the time we deploy or commit code and we deploy it through the pipeline, that pipeline already has the automated test stages or steps in place uh, exercising the code as it runs through the, uh, the pipeline. So really, that works quite well if you have your testers and your developers very closely aligned. And that also gives you the fast feedback, right? Because what happens is if it breaks, you need to know sooner rather than later. Because from a developer point of view, if you write a piece of code and that code only gets tested in a week's time, it's that context switching problem again, right? So the developer might have gone and started working on another user story. Now a week later, he's got to go back and rethink what did he do on that user story to, to solve it. If you can do it within the same sprint and have your testing done within the same sprint, then there's a better chance that you'll get it resolved much quicker than, than delaying that process. 
which brings us to our uh, last uh, uh, part of the, 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 the strategy. It's uh, the tools. Look, we can't get away from it. We do need tools. I mean, uh, you can't get automation going without tools. Although, hopefully, as you can see, it's not by far the, the, the biggest component of, of DevOps adoption, but certainly one of the three important ones. And as Darth Vader says, I find your lack of tools very disturbing. So you need, you need tools. You need to have proper tools to do the job. So I'll just run through a couple of examples of tools that we are using um, in our environment at the moment. First one, Jenkins, from a continuous integration point of view. And uh, we, we ha so Jenkins has this concept of uh, pipeline as code, right? So that's what we use. And what's nice about the pipeline as code is your, your Jenkins file actually sits inside your source code repository alongside your code. So anytime you need to deploy code, that file defines your CI um, um, process effectively. You know, what stages you're going to go through in terms of getting your code out the door effectively. Um, and again, it all lives in your source code repository. And if you read the continuous delivery book, that's also how they recommend it. Every configuration item needs to live in your source code repo. Um, and and that Jenkins makes that quite easy to do. So we've got a number of stages. So for our continuous integration um, stage, it takes about three and a half minutes. So that's everything from um, compiling the code to doing a full unit test run and to do, uh, we use Sonar Cube to do the code coverage analysis. So we test the code coverage. We also look at vulnerabilities on each commit to make sure that the developers haven't introduced new vulnerabilities in the process as well. It's actually quite funny because this particular project is built on .NET Core, um, which is Microsoft, but we compile it on Linux slaves. So it's actually quite a, quite a joke in the office because the developers are working in Visual Studio, but everything else is happening on, on Linux uh, machines under the covers. But .NET Core makes that possible, right? Because it, it's now supported across multiple platforms. So all our slaves are running um, uh, Linux, Ubuntu, and um, so we are able to actually build and test it um, in that fashion. And then there's just some graphs around um, Sonar Cube. As you can see for this particular project, we have 80% code coverage um, on, on this uh, project and like so over 300 unit tests that runs on every commit. What you will find is that on the last step, the publish step, so there's a test scan and then publish. So what publish does is it will now take the compiled code, it will create artifacts. So it will create the binary version of those uh, source code and then store it in an artifact repository. So we use Nexus for that. So we will store the artifact in Nexus so that when we do the deployment during the continuous delivery portion, those um, components that's responsible for deploying the code will go and grab it out of Nexus. So again, it makes sure that no one can taint the, the source code. You know, no one can slip in there and, and recompile a component and then slip it into a particular environment. If it's not in Nexus, then you can't get it onto that box effectively. So again, we put some controls in place there. So one of the tools that uh, we decided on, um, on using is called um, XR Release. It's from a company called Zebia Labs. So Zebia Labs develop enterprise DevOps tools as well. Um, I know a lot of people t like to do this through scripting. And again, there's multiple ways you can solve this. You know, there's not just one tool for the job. Uh, but what I like about XR Release is that it's, it's very graphical. You know, you can visually see all of the um, phases within your pipeline. So, so they call each release or each iteration through the pipeline, they call it release. So although it's not a release from a production release perspective, it's, it still runs through the whole pipeline. And as you can see is that we've got a number of phases, pre-release, develop, E2E, and QA. You'll notice that there's no production phase here. And that's only because um, our production release sits on a different pipeline. And that's, again, down to uh, governance, right? So the release managers, whilst they were happy to break down all of the barriers between these environments, because previously you had to have change requests even going from one environment to the next, we've, we've gone away with that. But for production, they 
much rather prefer still going through that manual approval process. And it's a journey, right? You know, we're not going to get day one all of these uh, barriers removed, you know? And as they start to trust these pipelines that we're building that, hey, wait a minute, these, these things are actually delivering quality code, we can start to trust the pipelines, we will slowly but surely start removing those kind of uh, obstacles as well to get to hopefully a true deployment pipeline all the way into production. So again, that's a work in progress. Um, what you'll see here is that we do a couple of things through our pipeline. So firstly, we set up test data. So the pipeline will do things like reset the databases to a, to a known state. It will create new test profiles that we need to use for test injection, test data injection into our tests, and it will do all of that stuff right up front. It, we also interface with Jira. So again, what happens is, as you kick off one of these uh, pipelines, we need to know well, what defects or what user stories are we actually testing as, as part of this release. So XR release talks back to Jenkins, and we can actually pull a list of all the user stories that's uh, related to this, and we now have context. So we know what are we doing in this uh, particular um, release, and therefore we can also start to do things like automatically transitioning those tasks in Jira automatically. And that's why I said in the beginning, you know, we also define the workflows within Jira, which makes this possible, so that um, as the pipeline starts taking care of uh, transitioning your, your, um, your applications from dev to ETV to QA to prod, you don't need a scrum master to go into, the, into Jira and say, okay, we are now in QA. Okay, now let's drag all the tasks up to QA, because that, is, that again is a manual task that someone has to do. The pipeline does all of that automatically. There's no, no need for anyone to do that. Um, and then from a deployment point of view, we um, use um, another component which I'll talk to you about now called Excel Deploy, which does the, the deployment of the physical code or the, the, the artifacts uh, onto the environment. So in this particular environment, we were running uh, on VMware and uh, Windows with IIS. Um, and what it will do is it will set up the environment for us on each deploy. We actually also have Ansible in here as well. So what happens is at the very first step in each one of these phases is, and you probably can't see it, it's actually an Ansible um, cookbook that we run, and that will ensure that the servers are in the right state, known state, for, uh, for that application to be deployed. So we make sure that we have the right version of IIS installed, make sure we've got the right patches installed, all of these things, because um, one thing that happens a lot in organizations is what we call environment drift. So environment drift is like, you know, people start making changes on particular hosts or servers, and they don't replicate it across all, all, all of the environments, and then when you deploy something and it breaks, you wonder why did it break? You know, it worked in one environment, but it doesn't work in the next environment, and that's largely due to environment drift. So by making sure that all of these servers are in the right state, we get consistency around that predictability. Um, and then, like I said, we have the full automated regression test as well as part of each, um, each pipeline. And then we also have the performance testing in here. So that performance testing is an interesting one, right? Because performance testing is, used to be like an exclusive function of, of a performance test team within the organization where it's a very s specific skill set, if I can call it that. that and the problem with that was that, again, if you wait till right at the end, when you're ready to go, to go live, you then bring the performance test team into, into the pro process, but by then it's almost too late. You know, they have no context of the project. Um, what, have, what happens if it fails the non-functional requirements? Do you not go live? Do you um, rush to try and get improvements? And that becomes a very difficult situation to navigate. So by having the performance test as part of our pipeline, we can actually do performance testing on every bolt that we put through the system. And that also gives us a very early indicator if things are starting to go wrong uh, very quickly. So the performance reports actually gives us that insight. And again, that closes that feedback loop that you need back to your developers to say, oh, wait a minute, that new library that you introduced has created a 200 millisecond latency um, overall and you need to look at that, for instance. So again, the commoditization of performance testing is really key to the strategy. And then lastly, we also have integration to chat ops. So we use Slack 
Um, every time we do deployments, we publish it on Slack so we know exactly um, you know, which bolt is, is being deployed right now and in which environment is currently sitting. And all of that communication is pumped through to, to uh, channels in, in Slack that, um, that we use. And we can do this whole process uh, in 45 minutes. And the only reason it's 45 minutes is because the performance tests run for half an hour uh, out of that 45 minutes where we like uh, really, you know, we, we do about, um, when we test this particular component, we do about um, 300,000 requests in, in, in a 30 minute time frame to, to, to see how the system behaves. And that's all part of the pipeline. So I spoke a little bit about Excel Deploy, uh, which like I said is the, the automation part of deploying your code onto, uh, onto one of more of those servers. The only thing I wanted to, to maybe highlight here is that you can very easily see where um, in, in, in the process you are. So you can see which versions of your application is deployed to Dev, ETE, QA, and, and also into production. So it's very nice to see which bolts are sitting where in your uh, environment. But there's also this concept of dictionaries. So dictionaries is again the idea of externalizing your configuration management capabilities. So you have different environments with different configuration properties, and it's all kept in, in dictionaries. Even things like passwords are kept in here because it's, um, it's masked. So therefore, um, you know, from a security point of view, you're not exposing any passwords in config files that sits in a source code repository. And as you deploy into environment, it will take those dictionary items and uh, apply it onto the config files and then deploy it onto those servers. So it works um, actually quite well. But with that being said, so that was based in 2018 where we started with this. At the end of 2018, we decided to move this particular uh, application to a microservice architecture because it was built on .NET Core. It sort of was the precursor to our microservice adoption uh, and it made it a lot easier to do. So this year we actually started to change the architecture slightly where um, we are now running that uh, component in, in, a, in, a, in a Kubernetes cluster effectively. Um, so as you can see, we still use uh, Jenkins to do the bolts. And then what Jenkins will do is it will create the, um, the, con the, the image, uh, the, the Docker image, which we then upload to, to, to Nexus. So all of our Docker images are sitting in Nexus. At the moment, we still use Excel release to talk to Kubernetes. So Excel release will basically go tell Kubernetes to stand up the servers, go stand up um, any other auxiliary services that we deploy as well um, to set up the, the, the ingress policies for this particular application. Um, and and um, everything's happening through the, the API layers. We have all written it in Python scripts effectively, what it boils down to, that interface with the Kubernetes APIs, and we're able to, to orchestrate that through XR release. What we are now looking at as, as we go through our own continuous improvement process is to start looking at uh, Argo CD. So Argo CD is also an open source project on GitHub. You can go and check it out. It's really cool for deploying Kubernetes-based workloads. Um, and again, there you can define what that um, pipeline should look like. So you can define in, um, also in uh, YAML files, similar to how you structure your Kubernetes um, um, resource configurations. You can do that in um, Argo as well, and then it will take care of the deployment to your dev, test, and prod clusters. Um, so this is something we're starting to look at um, as well at the moment. So the performance testing, I touched on this a little bit earlier on. And this is just an example. So we use something called BlazeMeter. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of BlazeMeter. So it's based on JMeter, which is open source. Uh, BlazeMeter just makes it more convenient, right? Because they have put all of the plumbing in place that allows you to do massive parallel performance testing um, using their, um, their infrastructure, basically. Um, they've got servers sitting in all the cloud providers that you can reuse. But you can also have what they call private locations. So private locations, you can only test from within your organization. You can actually have private locations that talks out to BlazeMeter so you can still run your tests from within the organization. Um, and what's also nice about it is it's based on YAML file definitions. Um, and um, 
The, it, it, the, the, the language they use is called Taurus. So again, I think it's TaurusCLI.org if you want to go check it out. But like I said, it's a YAML-based um, configuration, which is really, really nice because it allows you to define things like your concurrency, your ramp-up time, and also your scenarios um, can be very, very detailed in terms of you know, what payloads you send to what uh, requests, uh, what information do you want to harvest out of those responses and reuse in subsequent calls within your test. And it's all done through, through YAML configuration. So I think it's, it's, it's really, the, the, the time to value is, is very quick, effectively. Uh, and here you can just see an example of that report. We actually wrote the plugin for this, by the way. So it didn't exist in uh, Excel release, this particular plugin. So we wrote and, and contributed back to the community what we've done. So anyone else can, can start using it if, if you have Blaze Meter as well. So basically, if we look at our best DevOps um, um, strategy, these are a list of all the tools that we're using uh, today. Um, it's quite a lot, but you know, I'm not going to go through all of them. But basically, you know, we're continuously evolving, continuously looking at new tools. And again, coming back to that construct of uh, a, a beehive, you know, these guys are hard at work to evaluate new tools and come up with better ways to solve a, a lot of these problems. And this gives you just a taste of some of the things um, that we are using uh, today. And we're also looking at things like Chef as well to do configuration management as well going forward as well. Um, but uh, really, you know, what it all boils down to is the lessons learned, right? So drink copious amount of coffee. It's not going to happen overnight. Right? It's not something that, you know, I, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, yeah, um, I, you know, we bought Chef, we're doing DevOps. But it's not that easy. Or it's not that simple. You know, there's a lot more to it. The tooling side is certainly one aspect of it, but there's a, also an aspect to it that's more around how you change the organization, as, as you hopefully saw on the previous slides. And it's going to take time. Um, this handbook, which is also, I think, out in the bookstore, the DevOps handbook was a um, very valuable asset in coming up with our own strategy for adopting DevOps, and I would really recommend that. And you can even get Jace to sign it probably here on the floor as well. And sell, sell, sell. This might sound strange because, I mean, we're not in sales, but actually we are, right? Because even within the teams and, and, and projects that we're working, you know, we need to, to take those learnings to the rest of the organization. And if we don't do that, then we're not going to be able to influence, uh, you know, micro changes in the organization um, if, if, if we don't do that. So even as engineers, you need to take your learnings to, to you know, to your, to your sponsors, business sponsors, or to your colleagues that works probably in other teams. Um, and that's where the whole chapter idea is also quite neat, because if you have a, a, a chapter set up, you can get everyone that's got the same interests coming together like once a month, and you can share those kind of uh, learnings as well with your peers across the organization, uh, which is a, a good way to sell within your organization. But above all, just start doing it. You know, it's, it's a lot of times, especially in my consulting days, where it was a situation of, Yes, we are looking at how we can do this, but we're not actually doing anything. We are getting into this whole analysis paralysis phase where we're just too scared to start exploring and start experimenting. And I think the, the, the golden thread here is you need to start doing something. And you won't learn until you, you start experimenting. And like I said, you're not going to get it right on day one, but we are also th going through that journey and learning new things and improving on that. But you can't improve if you don't experiment. And challenge the status quo. You know, a lot of times in organizations, especially larger organizations like the banks, a lot of people are set in their ways. You know, that's how they've been doing it for the last 10 years. And who are you to, to, to challenge them on how it should be done? You know, so what if it takes two weeks to action a ticket? That's how we do it. You need to start challenging those kind of behaviors and, 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 and start to maybe include them so that they can start seeing what's actually involved um, so that they too can go, go or come on this journey and start improving their own practices. Because as we saw earlier this week as well, you know, it's great that from an engineering point of view, we're doing all of this cool stuff. But if everyone else in the organization is, has not bought into this, then you're always going to have 
this struggle. And so what if the color is pink? You might wonder, okay, what on earth, what, what does that mean? So one thing my manager always uh, says to me is, you know, it, you know, a lot of times as engineers, we get sort of uh, attached to certain tools or certain technologies, and we like, you know, you know, we might love Kubernetes, but for some reason, the organization might have chosen OpenShift. But you're like, I don't like OpenShift. It doesn't matter, you know. Make work what you've got in your organization. You know, you don't have to rip and replace everything to get this working. You know, if your organization has made some decisions around technologies, use it. If by using it, you can come up with actual data to support that it can't do the job, then you take the data back and say, actually, these tools are crap. We can't use it. We need to reinvest or re-look at other tools. And that's cool. But again, try to take the, 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 the subjective element out of the picture and say, well, let's use what's there and then come up with data points to support our arguments going forward. But above all, just have fun. It's, that's what we're here for. And if we don't have fun, then why are we doing this? And with that, uh, I wanted to close off and say thank you very much for, for this opportunity. A few minutes for questions. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk and sharing cool. your experience. I have one particular nugget that I was looking and I couldn't find when you were talking through is security. Now, uh, you know, banking is is also a place where security takes a lot of precedence. But I couldn't see that as a part of the pipeline or the things that you're using or the last one. So do yeah. you want to share? So, so security, you know, there's a, a lot of the things have entrenched security built into, the, into it, right? So for instance, using XR release to do the deployments, you know, that's gone through rigorous security risk assessments as well to make sure that the tools we use are um, you know capable from a security risk point of view to safeguard the organization around things like passwords and stuff but then there's also things like penetration testing right which is more to do with okay so we need anytime we release new software we have to go through a level of penetration testing to make sure that you know we again haven't introduced new vulnerabilities that is not on here because that is still one element that's done manually quite right. And that's something that we are obviously working on to see how we can automate that and make that part of the process. Yeah. 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 And that's why I say, you know, that, um, so part of that is done through Sonic Cube. So Sonic Cube can do uh, security vulnerability, but then the, the static uh, application uh, code analysis, Right? Uh, or security testing, static application security testing, that bit is still uh, manual. Yeah. Hi, Jacko. Uh, a quick question. I know uh, you've mentioned no time, so I'd like to understand what no time is I mean, from quarterly to weekly, no time, right? So, and follow up question to that is that I'd like to understand what's the ROI? Because right now, looking at the tools, I mean, it's quite many and it's a good amount of investment. Plus, we also have the current running process to the mind shift, context switch, and people probably learning and acting on it. It's a cost as well. Mm. So what's the ROI that currently mm. that you see? And I mean, how soon you think uh, you have found that, you know, for your organization, yeah. how soon you got the ROI? Cool. Uh, good question. So um, so before, like I said, before we, we, we started to build this, this capability, if, if I can call it that, you know, production releases only happened, like I said, once every three to four months. Okay, so it was a very slow cadence at the time. So we run two weekly sprints, okay? And every Friday, we do a production release. Um, so that's the cadence we're on now. So every Friday of the week, we do a production release. And then every Second week, what will typically happen is um, if you do your, um, your, your, your demo days that you have with your business stakeholders at, at the end of the sprint to show what you've been doing, typically after that show and tell, we will go and press the button and deploy that code into production. So if they are happy with what we've done, um, we will deploy to production. So that's happening on a, on a weekly basis. Now, obviously, there's, there's times where we're not introducing any new functionality, then we might skip a week. But typically, it's like every 
Friday. And the idea is to bring that down to daily releases. But like I said, it's a journey. We're not there yet, but we would like to get to that point where we can do daily releases. Um, as for an ROI, so to give you an idea, is we built a capability um, using this methodology, which uh, took us um, 16 weeks to get it into production and in front of customers. And there was another project that's running in parallel, that's been running in parallel, to deliver on the same capability that's using traditional waterfall. They've been working for two years. They're not in production yet. In 16 weeks, we landed in production. And within the three months, we've made over 100 million revenue uh, on that product by de deploying it earlier. So from an ROI point of view, we were able to do, do realize business value a lot sooner than some of the traditional IT projects that is still trying to catch up with, with this. Cool. Awesome. Thank you very much. Sure.